Good afternoon and welcome to another Walker webcast. It is my um, great pleasure and honor to have Lotfi Karoui uh, join me today. Uh, Lotfi uh, is the chief credit strategist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he is responsible for research and views on global credit markets. He joined Goldman Sachs in 2007 and was named managing director in 2015. Uh, he publishes regularly on the state of the fixed income markets and asset allocation. Uh, prior to joining uh, Goldman Sachs, Luffy taught undergraduate and graduate level courses in finance and operations research at McGill University and HEC Montreal. Uh, Luffy's academic research spans fixed income markets, interest rate models, and macro finance. It has been recognized with awards from the Financial Mathematics Institute of Montreal and published in a number of leading academic journals, such as the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, the Journal of Financial Economics, and the Journal of Derivatives. Born and raised in Tunisia, uh, Lotfi graduated from the Institut des Haut Estudes Comerciales in Carthage, Tunisia, with a bachelor's degree in finance in 2000. He earned a master's degree in financial engineering from HEC Montreal in 2002, and a PhD in financial economics from McGill University in 2007. Uh, Lotfi is fluent in Arabic and French and English. Uh, so uh, Lotfi, thank you so much for joining me today. Let me start here. Um, I watched an interview that Paul Tudor Jones gave last week on CNBC, and in it he said, uh, you don't want to be in bonds or stocks right now. Can't think of a worse macro environment than we are in right now. Do you agree with Paul Tudor Jones' view on the markets we're in today? I certainly, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, but I, I certainly agree with the notion that one of the key shifts that we've seen in the last couple of months is really the return of cash as a scalable and investable asset class. So think about it this way. You can park your cash by buying two-year treasuries, for example, have a total yield of two and a half percent. That is a very valuable degree of freedom that you sort of lost for the last two years. And so basically the urgency to be invested all the time, whether it's in bonds and stocks and commodities, real assets, that urgency has dramatically declined. Same things for the, you know, the, the need to buy the dip on a, on a constant basis, I think that need has dramatically declined. And, and, and the biggest driver of that is that now you have the ability to park your cash, earn a decent amount of money and sleep very well at night. And so that, that's nothing short of a paradigm shift in my view. Now, with respect to the view on risk assets themselves, whether it's you know credit or, or equities, uh, look, I do think that you need to recognize that we've built a fair amount of risk premium. So corporate bond spreads, for example, have widened quite dramatically just the past two weeks. You've also dramatically improved the value proposition of fixed income from an all-in yield standpoint. I'll give you one concrete example. If you look at public investment grade bonds, for example, they yield on average around four and a quarter, four and a half percent. The last time you saw that was in 2011, 2010. And so uh, you know, the math looks slightly different, and our message has been that you should probably re-engage, but you should pick your pockets or pick, pick, your, pick your spots, so to speak, focusing on pockets of the markets where the rebuild of risk premium has gone far enough, either in, 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 in absolute terms or in relative terms. But I don't disagree with this idea that, you know, the game has changed a little bit, and that risk-free asset that you lost for two years is now back into the system. And that gives you an option that you didn't have only six or nine months ago. And so we're up 150 basis points year to date on the 10 year and about 200 basis points on the two year. And um, as I was watching Jeffrey Gunlich um, of Double Line in an interview uh, earlier uh, this week. And he was basically saying that the last four months have been the worst four months for uh, treasury and investment grade bonds uh, ever back to his calculation was back to 1978. Uh, do you see a reprieve ahead? Is, is the worst behind us as it relates to the, to the, to the, to the bond markets? Most likely, yes. I mean, you're right. You know, anything that has a little bit of duration risk in it is probably off to its worst start ever. That is true for investment grade bonds. It's true for treasury bonds, agency MBS, high yield bonds, you name it. Literally anything that has a rates component in it has suffered pretty big declines in price returns. Now, 
I think relative to the last four months, I do think that the symmetry has clearly improved. Uh, you know, 10 year is close to 3%. The curve has flattened a fair amount, uh, notwithstanding maybe a week or two where we saw a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, st re steepening. But yeah, we're close to the end of it. And in fact, typically, if you look at the history of rates bear markets, uh, what you see is that actually total returns start recovering way before you get to the peak in uh, in in ten year yields or five year yields. I don't think things will play out in any different ways. And so I do think that if you have a six, nine month or even a twelve month type of horizon, I do think that you have to recognize that the asymmetry has has improved here. Now that is all predicated on one key view here, which is that the terminal value of Fed funds rates, which is where you know, that Fed funds rate is going to peak in the cycle should be around three and three quarter percent. If you disagreed with that view, or if you thought that we could overshoot that to say 4%, and some people have been floating numbers like 5%, then it's probably a little bit premature to dip your toes and add risk into, in, into bonds. But uh, that is not the Goldman Sachs view. We're of the view that three, three and a quarter is probably uh, you know, a sensible sort of target to think about. Of course, there are risks to the upside, there are risks to the downside, but three, three and a quarter percent is, is, is the most likely outcome in our view as far as the terminal value of Fed funds rates go. 10 years is close to 3%, five years not far. So we're almost there. Um, it could be some volatility, but certainly from a, a, a distribution of risk standpoint, um, you know, the worst is definitely behind us at this point. When you're talking about the Fed funds rate and some people thinking that it gets up into the low threes, um, it makes me think about an inverted yield curve being a predictor of a recession. And um, one of the things I'm curious about is, as you look at an inverted yield curve to determine a recession, do you look at the 10 year to the two year or do you look at the 10 year to the three month? I mean, they both sort of give you the same answer. It's been sort of documented in the academic literature that the, the spread of 10 year to three months does a slightly better job. But there's no question that if you went back to the last four or five recessions, the shape of the slope of the yield curve, the slope of the yield curve has done a, a fantastic job in predicting recessions. However, there's a couple of caveats behind that. Number one, you know, correlation is not causation. So it is a very powerful predictor of where the economy will head eventually, but there's not much of a story behind it other than, you know, the fact that they, they, they sort of one leads the, the other. Two, there's a lot to be said about this cycle and, and, and how different it is from, you know, anything we've seen since the onset of the great moderation in the early 80s. But one key difference, I think, in this cycle is that you do have a very flat nominal curve but a very steep real curve, right? And so what matters eventually for the economy is how much tightening you have in real terms, not in nominal terms. And to me, you know, I look at the, the, the shape of the curve in real terms and it's still very steep by historical norms. And so that's counter argument number one. Counter argument number two, fundamentally, yes, the path to, towards a, a soft landing has clearly narrowed because the equation that the Fed is trying to solve is a very difficult one. Basically, the Fed is trying to slow down the economy, we think, to half a point to a point below trend. And in doing so, it's basically trying to discourage companies from hiring, or it's, it's, it's trying to slow down the pace of hiring without causing companies to actually cut the workforce. And that's a narrow path almost by design. It's a very difficult equation to, to, to solve. But even if we get a slowdown in the economy, keep in mind that we're going into this in a position of strength. When you look at the, the, the state of, of fundamentals of the private sector, i.e. the sum of households and, 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 and non-financial corporations, I'll take non-financial corporations, which is one sector that I watch very closely. The bulk of the proceeds from the debt that was raised in 2020 and 2021 hasn't been spent. It basically is still sitting comfortably on balance sheets in the form of excess cash uh, that is there, you know, to allow companies to withstand, you know, any adverse shock could potentially be a recession. Same thing for, for households. In fact, households went into the pandemic already in a position of strength. We had a, a decade basically of nonstop deleveraging after the global financial crisis. Uh, things have kept getting better actually since, but 
the, the amount of excess savings on household balance sheets is still very elevated. Uh, one of the side effects of, 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 a, of a hot housing market is that it gives households a lot of untapped equity that they can use, you know, if basic, basically things go wrong. And so even if you get a slowdown, I do think it's important to think about the depth of that slowdown. But as I see it today, you have enough lines of defense, I think, to isolate you or, or, or prevent you from, from experiencing a large shock. But to me, you're not seeing the type of imbalances in the private sector that you saw in the run-up to the global financial crisis, or even prior to that, in the run-up to, to the 2001, 2002 recession, where you had excessive capex basically in the telecom sector that eventually led to, to, to a recession. None of that is just true today. I think what you have today is a pretty unique set of circumstances. There's an imbalance in the labor market. The Fed is trying to correct it. If it, if it succeeds, great. I think we'll basically realize that we're sort of in, in mid-cycle and that this cycle can live for a little longer. If it doesn't, then I think there's something to be said about the depth of the recession. And I don't think that depth is gonna be well, you know, remotely close to what we saw in certainly 08, 09, or even prior to that in 2001, 2002. So a lot in there. Let me um, let me go at a couple of them. Um, the first one is you talked about a soft landing. What what in your mind defines a soft landing? Everyone talks about a soft landing, and we're all like, oh, well, what, what, like what does that specifically mean? Either as it relates to where inflation is, where rates are, where the markets are, where employment is. How do you define soft landing? So right now we're in a situation where you know the trade off between growth and inflation has changed basically and it looks very different from anything we've experienced since the onset of the great moderation in the early 80s what i mean by that is that you have a federal reserve whose reaction function is a lot more sensitive to upside risk and inflation as opposed to downside risk and growth and that totally makes sense i mean the second mandate of the fed is price stability and so it is you know totally logical that they would defend that side of the mandate a soft landing would basically look like this. You know, you slow down the economy below trend. So we think one and a half percent on an annualized basis for GDP growth. Uh, you discourage companies from continuing to fill up new positions or hiring more people. And so you correct the imbalance that we're seeing in the labor market. By doing that, you also avoid the risk of a, of a, of a wage price spiral which is similar to what you saw in, in, in a lot of places in the emerging world, for example, where we saw that in the US in the, in, in, in the 70s. And so the soft landing basically looks like slowing down the economy back below potential while avoiding a recession, i.e. a scenario in which you, you, you cause companies to overreact a little bit uh, and, and cut the workforce as opposed to just slow down the pace of hiring. And so, it is an incredibly difficult equation to solve it. In fact, if you go back to the last cycles in the US, it has never been achieved. Now, what gives us confidence that you know, the Fed has a good shot in achieving that this time around is, number one, I think the evidence outside of the US is quite encouraging, at least if you look at the, you know, the G10 universe, and so advanced economies that are sort of similar to ours. Uh, and, and then, like I said earlier, you go into this, with a few interesting lines of defense, namely, particularly the fact that the private sector is in, is in pretty good shape today. And so you don't have to worry about imbalances uh, like you did back in 08, 09 or, or, or prior to that. But that's what a soft landing looks like. Now, just to be clear, that path is narrow. It does look narrower than it was only a couple of months ago. And that's one of the reasons why we put the odds of a recession over the next two years at around 35%. So that's more you know, elevated than, than the sort of long run average, but it's still there. I think it's doable. Uh, the other thing that I would add, I would pay attention to the high frequency indicators, but we had two back-to-back -back readings in core PCE that were quite encouraging in my view, but on an annualized basis, you had core PCE at three and a half percent, which is fantastic news. I mean, I wouldn't overreact to it. I think the, the April prints will, will be very important to watch. But there's some evidence to suggest that the peak is likely behind us at this point. The key question is what type of speed of mean reversion you're gonna have and how much confidence will that give the Fed to sort of moderate a little bit the, best, the, the pace of, uh, of, of tightening in monetary policy. On that, Lofi, I, I think that um, tomorrow we have the, the, the print for March coming out, yeah. uh, no, excuse me, for April coming out. And 
we um, there's a lot of talk that that is going to be you know down in 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 the basis points and not at sort of a, a north of 100 basis points. If we were to get a print that's sort of 20 basis points of inflation during the month, rather than I think it was 120 basis points a year ago, do you think that that then plays into the Fed's thinking that the inflationary pressures are going to recede from here and that rather than looking at potentially three 50 basis point rate hikes, they could put that final rate hike out there and, and potentially come in on that one in, in, in three meetings from now? I mean, look, monetary policy is rarely, in fact, never on autopilot mode. Everything is data dependence, right? And so, yes, uh, I think as it stands right now, we'll most likely have two back-to-back 50 basis point hikes, one in June, one in July. Whether the Fed goes back to 25 basis point increments will depend on what you just described. We need to see evidence that actually things are getting better on the inflation side. If things go according to plan, so to speak, and if we see, uh, you know, uh, a deceleration or or some kind of a return towards the long run average, then I think that will give the Fed greater confidence that they've sort of engineered the soft landing and you'll likely see 25 basis point increments in September onwards as opposed to 50. If on the other hand, for whatever reason, you know, one potential channel could be uh, you know, another round of supply chain disruptions, for example, that further exacerbates the pressure in, in, in goods inflation. If that's the case, then I think that could force the Fed to lean more towards a, a 50 basis point hike in, in, in September. So to answer your question, things are data dependent. I think now we have pretty good confidence that we'll get to back to back 50 basis point hikes June and July. After that, you'll need a couple of data points to get the Fed comfortable that actually things are heading in the wrong direction. And if that's the case, then you're back to 25 basis point type of uh, type of scenario. I know you watch the oil markets quite um, closely, and I wanna dive into some of the inputs here on the inflationary pressure and get your insights into where you think we might see some, if you will, moderation and, and where you think kind of inflation is baked for the foreseeable future, like you just talked about labor markets. Um, on, on oil, as I was getting ready for this, I, I read an article that was um, talking about the three, two, one crack spread, which was something that I'd never heard about before. And I'm, I'm assuming you know about it. And let me, for our listeners, just explain it really quickly, which is just that the markets are very focused on the spot price for WTI crude. And right now that's trading at 108 or $110 uh, a barrel. Um, but actually that isn't what's driving the inflationary pressure in the oil markets. It's actually the refined oil that is coming out. And that's the three, two, one crack spread where you need three barrels of crude to turn it into two barrels of refined gasoline for our cars and one barrel of refined diesel fuel or jet fuel. And and those prices per barrel are in the 165 for refined gasoline and the 275 for refined diesel and jet fuel. And so and, and, and so I think one of the interesting things there is while the U.S. and other governments have sort of flooded the markets with their reserves of crude oil, our real problem and bottleneck today is actually on refining capacity and that refineries aren't investing to make up for some of the capacity they lost during the pandemic. Is what I've read on this correct? And do you see any way for us to get out of that other than just shrinking the demand side of the equation? Yes, I think that's definitely the view of our, you know, my colleagues on the commodity side, which is demand destruction is probably the only way to rebalance the market here. And and precisely for the reasons that you mentioned, which is we've had more than a decade of chronic underinvestment in the in the oil and gas industry. And so the ability to bring supply very quickly in order to rebalance the market is actually quite diminished. And so that leaves you with the demand side of the equation as pretty much the only mechanism through which you can rebalance things. The two other things I would add, and this is where it gets interesting, is that if we went through a shock like this 30 years ago, four years ago, the US economy would have immediately slipped into recession. Now that's not the case anymore. And and a lot of that is because yes, you know, you do take a hit on the consumer side because it costs more, you know, to fill up your tank and, and gasoline prices are higher, et cetera. But there's a meaningful offset through the the energy sector or the energy industry. And so on net, it sort of isolates and protects the U.S. economy from 
the negative uh, effect of these oil uh, shocks because in terms of magnitude, the shock that we went through is actually on par with uh, you know, with the 70s, except that its impact on the real economy hasn't been that that you know that big. Europe, on the other hand, is in a dramatically different position, in my view, because you know it's a net importer of, of, of commodities, particularly on the energy and the metal side and the natural gas side. That matters not just for consumption, but it also matters for industrial production. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why, on the credit side, at least we've been more positive on the US relative to Europe is because we see more downside risk to growth there. And a lot of that downside risk is coming from a, a stronger reliance on, on Russia in terms of commodity imports. Uh, but in the US, as far as the US goes, I think one of the really interesting lessons of the last couple of, of months is that we're able now to withstand shocks of this magnitude in the old market, which is absolutely fascinating in my view, because if we went through the same thing only 20 years ago, uh, the odds would have been very high that the economy would have slipped into a recession. Now, that wasn't the case this time around. I heard you say a year ago, just what you just said makes me think about it. A year ago, you were talking about the fact that the that investors see great confidence in the durability of the recovery. And here we are a year later, I think, from exactly when you made that interview. Do you think we're still in a recovery? I think the jury is out as what exactly is the age of the cycle? Certainly, you know, you passed basically full employment and that, that typically indicates that you sort of transitioning into, uh, you know, the, the last inning or the final inning of, 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 the, of, the, of this business cycle. So to answer your question, yes, I think, you know, it's pretty unique in many, in many aspects. And, and there's definitely a debate as to how old exactly the cycle is based on the labor market. Seems like it's actually pretty old based on market pricing, uh, there's a little bit of a debate, right? Like if you look at the rates market, we started the conversation with the shape of the yield curve, that seems to suggest that we're sort of close to an inflection point and that the cycle is, is sort of old. If you look at corporate credit spreads, actually spreads are at levels that are consistent with an economy that's still at mid cycle. If you look at S&P multiples, yeah, same thing. Multiples have contracted a little bit on the back of the April sell-off, but the grand scheme of things, you're not remotely close to levels that are you sort of implying an economy that's heading to, to, to a recession. And so I think that dispersion in views definitely highlight the uniqueness of the cycle. There is no playbook basically for the current cycle. It's unique in so many aspects that I'd be careful sort of not extrapolating too much. The other thing that I would add is that, you know, if you're a fixed income investor, I think it, it's obviously very important to think about the, the stage of the business cycle and when you are, but it's even more important to think about the credit cycle, right? Like, and typically those are kind of the same thing. They co-move together. If you actually take 30 years of default data, what you see is basically four data points or four big humps and those corresponded with the last four recessions. However, this time around, I think you know you could argue quite confidently that the credit cycle is still very young. And the reason for that is we're starting year two post pandemic. And so you haven't had enough time to sort of misallocate capital and make bad decisions that eventually cause credit fundamentals to deteriorate and then the cycle to inflect. And so there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, between the credit cycle and then the broader business cycle. And I wouldn't be surprised that even if we're wrong and even if you get a recession, say in 2023, it would not surprise me to see, you know, defaults and, 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 and all sorts of metrics of financial distress sort of decouple from the general state of the economy and outperformance, so to speak, uh, mainly because the credit cycle is young, that I can confidently say. The business cycle, I don't know. I think it's a big question mark as, as to how, ex how old exactly is this business cycle. Yeah. Um on that, last year you were talking a lot about investors in the bond market seeking yield and um, going and investing in even C-rated bonds to try and get that additional yield. Now that we're a year later and the, econ the economy isn't running quite as hot as it was a year ago, do you think that there's any issue there as it relates to people being stuck in jump debt that might default? I think the number you used um, last year, Lotfi, was that... Um, your prediction was that there would be 13% defaults in, in, in the high yield market. Um, how do we end up at the end of 2021 as it relates to, because that's like a, from my take on what you said, that's sort of a recessionary 
level as it relates to defaults on high yield debt. And so how do we end up 21 and what do you think about high yield in 22? Very benign from a default standpoint. And in fact, one of the many remarkable aspects of this, of this recession is actually how benign the default cycle turned out to be on the back of the pandemic. And so, you know, if you look at the 12 month trailing default rate in the high yield bond market, for example, that peaked around six and a half, seven percent, which is lower than what you typically see in a recession. Now, of course, that speaks to a lot of things, but the most important driver of, of that lower default rate or lower peak in default rate was the strength of the policy response that you had, both on the monetary, but especially on the fiscal side. Um, we had basically perfect income substitutions for, for, for households and, and, and small businesses. And then for larger corporations, the big game changer in the cycle was the decision of the Fed to announce the corporate credit facilities, which was literally the turning point in markets on March 23rd, 2020. And so that's one aspect. In terms of the forward trajectory of, of defaults, I don't expect defaults to increase a lot. That's certainly a debate that we're starting to have with investors. There are some people who are raising the alarm bell on, on defaults. Uh, and the narrative that you typically hear is that, well, funding costs have increased dramatically. You're going to have a little bit of a payment shock among non-financial corporations. We disagree with that narrative for, for really one simple reason, which is the debt servicing capacity of non-financial corporations, including lower rated ones, including triple C rated companies, is the best we've seen ever. And so you can factor in a shock of 100 basis points or 200 basis points in the cost of funding, I think it won't do much. You need something a lot bigger than that. And then the second argument that I would make is that, you know, it's assets and liabilities. You can make the cost of your liabilities higher, great. Keep in mind that we're also in a, in a, in a high nominal GDP sort of growth type of environment. And so your assets are also growing at the same time. The ratio, I think, shouldn't change that much in my view, but we've always been quite skeptical in this idea that going into a hiking cycle, you should expect a, 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 a some something that looks like a payment shock for non-financial corporations. And so I don't expect defaults to increase. That being said, we do think that the case to be down in the quality spectrum, so be overweight those triple C rated bonds has dramatically weakened because the other really major shift that happened in fixed income markets recently, particularly in high quality segments of fixed income, investment grade, agency MBS, is that the level of yields has reset to much higher levels and the level of prices has gone down quite dramatically. And so before this call, I was actually looking at, you know, the 2020 vintage of, of, of issuance. And a lot of these bonds were issued at par and went to 130, 140, and now they're back to par, right? Yeah. So. Uh, you've created a lot of upside convexity in, in high quality markets and all of the sequel that should incentivize investors to actually start moving up in quality just because you're being paid better today, uh, you know, to own low beta assets. Uh, so the, again, back to the, where we started the conversation, I do think that search field motives have declined partly because you brought back better yield support into fixed income. And so the incentives have weakened quite a lot. Third thing I would add, this is also a unique aspect on this cycle, but if we had this conversation in 2017, we would have been talking about the Fed sort of normalizing policy and then the rest of the world being on hold. That is absolutely not the situation we're in today. The normalization process of monetary policy is a lot more synchronized. Everyone is heading in the same direction, maybe with the exception of, of the Bank of Japan, but everyone is actually normalizing monetary policy and so yields globally are rising pretty much at, at, at a similar pace. And, and that is good news for high quality fixed income assets. So um, looping back for a moment on the inflationary pressures, um, housing, um, the, they, I saw it was published this morning that um, the average rent across the country for a one bedroom apartment uh, is up 12% between March of 21 and March of 22. Um, a year ago, you thought the housing market would go from, from white hot to warm by the end of 2021. It stayed hot pretty much throughout the year. Um, so in your mind, what's, what's 22 look like? I think I heard you on CNBC say that your estimation was that you'd see 
price appreciation in the single family housing space of about 8% in 2022, and then normalizing to something closer to two to 3% in 2023. Have you changed that view or is that pretty much where you are on the single family front? No, we're, we're, still, we're still of the same view. And so uh, high single digit levels this year, a lot of it, by the way, was realized already in the first two to three months of the year, but you should expect some normalization for the remainder of the year. And then back to normal, in 2023, but this story has been exactly what you just described, which is a tug of war a little bit between deteriorating affordability in the form of high mortgage payments. I'll give you one interesting stat, but on our estimate, the average uh, monthly mortgage payment in the US has actually increased by 41% this year. That's a combination of higher basically home prices, but also higher mortgage rates. You're above 5% for the first time since 2010. Uh, but on the other hand, you're still operating in a market where supply is very, very tight. And up until now, tight inventories or tight supply has sort of kept the upper hand on deteriorating affordability. I think over time, you should expect the balance to kind of drift a little bit more towards, towards deteriorating affordability ultimately pushing basically house price appreciation or the pace of house price appreciation back to trend, which is anywhere between two and a half and, and 3%. Now, one question that we get all the time from market participants is, is this a problem from a financial stability standpoint, right? Like the trauma of the global financial crisis is actually still there. A lot of people have in mind, so the memories of you know, strong house price appreciation eventually leading to a bubble and a, and a, and a full-blown financial crisis. We're absolutely not in that situation today. In fact, if you look at lending standards, they're actually quite tight. They're certainly a lot tighter relative to what we saw back in, uh, you know, in, in 07, 08. So I don't think this is a, a problem from a, a financial stability standpoint. Uh, this is just, a, again, it's a unique situation in which we've sort of underbuilt for many years, in fact, since the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And now you're in a situation where there's no supply, very little supply. And so demand has come down, but it's still far off basically from where supply is. And so it will take another leg basically of deterioration and affordability to sort of rebalance the market here. It's really interesting on all of that. Last week, Art Laffer wrote in the Wall Street Journal an article as it relates to kind of what the Fed ought to be doing and the need to tamp down on inflation. And one of the stats that he put into his op-ed piece was that between 1972 and 1981, hourly earnings in the United States went from $4 an hour to $7 an hour, or, relative, or roughly 70% appreciation in wages. But purchasing power due to inflation fell by 12%. And he noted in that, because I think he wanted to capture the attention of the Biden administration, both Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter were voted out of office after being elected to one term. Um, so uh, I think one of the, and, and he goes on to say that, that workers purchasing power over the last 12 months has decreased by 3%, even with wages going up. And you just talked about that kind of stunning number as it relates to the mortgage costs being up over 40% year over year. What's happening with wages in the sense of, um, I mean, so much, you, you talked about household balance sheets being better than they've almost ever been, both going into the pandemic and clearly coming out of the pandemic, given the amount of liquidity that the Fed pumped into the system. Um, but unless people have, if you will, free cash flow, um, they're not sitting on some balance sheet sitting there managing it like you or I would managing a corporation. They're, 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 they're going paycheck to paycheck. What's the view on wages and wage growth? Because the Fed's trying to push that down at the same time as we have all this inflationary pressure. Isn't there a mismatch coming up here, uh, Lotfi? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the biggest risk, which is the risk of a wage price spiral, similar to what you had in the 70s and up until the early 80s. And so wages go up, but prices go up even more. And so you're sort of constantly catching up a little bit and caught in a spiral. We think that risk is actually quite low. If anything, a lot of the high frequency indicators that we look at uh, do seem to suggest that, you know, there are signs that, you know, wage inflation is sort of abating a little bit and that, that sort of the risk of that vicious circle a little bit is declining. But I don't disagree that that would be the biggest risk, I think, to the outlook, not least because it would force an even more aggressive pivot of monetary policy. Um, 
you know, that was certainly the playbook that we had in the 80s, which is eventually it led to a double dip recession, two back to back recessions in order to sort of rebalance things and get us back to uh, to, to where we, we sh should be in terms of, of inflation. Uh, the other, I think, risk, in addition to uh, some kind of a wage price spiral, which again is not our baseline view, we think we'll avoid that, is what I would call the risk of de-anchoring of long-term inflation expectations. And so this idea that you're constantly anticipating prices to go up, and as a result of that, you buy more today. And so again, it sort of generates a little bit of a spiral too. The good news is that we're not seeing any evidence of that. Of course, you know, those of us who look at fixed income markets know, you know, the five-year, five-year forward inflation. That's the one metric that everyone looks at. If you look at it, it's been, you know, very well behaved. Same thing if you look at some of the survey-based measures of long-term inflation expectations, they do look okay to me, but of course, if there's any evidence that long-term inflation expectations are becoming de-anchored a little bit, then that would force, again, an even more aggressive posture from the Fed in terms of monetary policy. But to, to, to back to your question with respect to the risk of a wage price spiral, that is not our baseline view. We think that would actually be avoided. So your team worked on a, on a research piece that came out, I think, last week called the Postmodern Cycle. And um, I just want to talk about it for a moment. I think the and, and in it, it calls for a, a bigger risk um, in inflation than deflation, greater regionalization, more expensive labor and commodities, and larger and more active governments. Those are sort of the main yeah. tenets, at least, that I took out of it. Um, the first thing that I just wanted to ask you, Lotfi, is the way the paper is set up and the fact that it basically looks at three eras pre-1980, 1980 to 2022, and then post-2022. Yep. I sat there and I, and, I, and I read it and I sort of said to myself, that's a pretty dramatic statement as it relates to the new fundamentals. In other words, like uh, I listened to Alan Patrickoff this morning on CNBC and he's sitting there saying, oh, most people investing today never lived through a bad market. And I sort of say, hang on a second. Most people investing today got were around for the great financial crisis. They were around for the pandemic. We've all seen lots of shocks come into the market at various times. Okay, so let's not go back to just you got to be 75 years old and a lot of gray hair to have lived through markets. But I found it to be striking that the Goldman piece was segmenting sort of, if you will, the history of economic theory and the economy into three big chunks, one of being a 42 year period. And now all of a sudden you think that things have materially changed going forward. Can you dive into that a little bit on why you see right now such yeah. a dramatic shift? Yeah, yeah, and it was, first of all, is it, why cut it that way? Why basically the pre eighties, post eighties, and then, and then right. period onwards? I mean, the answer is the pre eighties is the pre great moderation period, a period where you had elevated macro volatility in the form of high inflation, high growth, big swings in the business cycle. And then came the post Volcker period, which featured a steady decline in inflation expectations, stronger predictability in monetary policy. That's also a big change. And then more generally, lower macro volatility, maybe notwithstanding some violent episodes like the global financial crisis. But aside from that, it was a period where macro vol has, was, was trending lower, inflation was under control, maybe too, you know, in an excessive way, maybe. But that was sort of the great moderation. Now we're in a different regime, whether we like it or not. And I think uh, Peter Oppenheimer, my colleague who wrote the report, perfectly summarized that, which is, you know, this cycle is different in many aspects, but, uh, you know, those that you mentioned, which is, uh, you know, more aggressive fiscal policy, you got to see more fiscal spending. I mean, Europe in particular is the one place where you will see more fiscal spending because you need to decouple from Russia and how you do that, we need to spend more. Uh, what we've seen the last two to three months is stronger commitments in terms of defense budgets in, in, in Germany. I think that will probably be mimicked in other countries in Europe. You've seen stronger commitments to um, invest in renewable energy and decouple from Russia. All of that essentially will have to be financed. And the result of that, you're gonna see more bonds basically issued on the sovereign side. And that will justify higher levels of risk premium because you know, investors will have to absorb all of that. Second shift, I think, is this idea that, you know, 
the at least if you look at the the, the trajectory of markets in the economy post global financial crisis, it's sort of fair to say that you've had a lot of inflation in financial markets, very little inflation in, in the real economy. If you think about what's lying next, it's almost like the flip side of that, you know, a little bit. Where, of course, we'll normalize on the inflation side. The question is, where are we going to settle eventually? And I think we'll probably settle at levels that are higher structurally relative to sort of the equilibrium that prevailed, uh, you know, pre pre pandemic. On the other hand, for risk assets, there's quite a lot of headwinds that you need to take into account. One of them is that the real cost of capital is going to go up because one of the reasons why April, just to take that as a as a data point, was so painful for risk assets, particularly in the equity market, is because you had a sell off in, in nominal yields that was entirely driven by the real yield component. And so when you make the cost of capital in real terms more expensive, everything has to be readjusted accordingly. Your equity risk premium, your credit risk premium, any premium that you demand to hold you know, a risky asset has to go up and adjust accordingly. And I think that's sort of the path going forward. If again, you think that real cost of capital should adjust higher in response, to a new regime that features a structurally higher equilibrium level of inflation. And one of the one of the other pieces to it, which I found to be fascinating, was this move from globalization to regionalization. And in it, there's a there's a very interesting explanation that for this past 42 years, whenever we needed additional labor, typically it went offshore. Whenever we needed new manufacturing capacity, it went offshore. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have to, you're going to find companies that have to invest in labor in their local markets for basically the first time in four decades. Um, you're going to have corporations that rather than just going in offshoring a manufacturing facility where we've all sat around and seen these numbers as far as manufacturing both in the US and more dramatically in Europe, you have in there a graph on German manufacturing. I mean, yeah. it, it makes Donald Trump's graphs on US manufacturing look like a walk in the park as it relates to the number of jobs lost in Germany to manufacturing offshore. And it's an interesting paradigm shift as it relates to not only investing in human capital, investing in property, plant and equipment, but then also the how you're going to finance all that to exactly what you just pointed out as it relates to more capex expenditures, more issuance of bonds at a higher cost, and how that's going to change corporate balance sheets in the United States. Yeah, I mean, look, we would characterize that as a slowdown in the face of globalization as opposed to a complete rollback of possibly three decades of globalization. But you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're bringing back supply chain to local markets as opposed to constantly seeking you know the optimal way uh you know to 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 build things well then you're introducing inefficiencies basically and all else equal that is also inflationary and so that is probably one of one additional reason to expect the whatever equilibrium level will prevail in terms of inflation to possibly be higher than what we had, you know, in the past, you know, two to three, two, two to three decades. But I guess, you know, the big debate we're having is, are we on the verge of a complete rollback of three or four decades of globalization? Or is it just a slowdown in the base of globalization? We're probably in the latter camp here, which is, we don't, I think it's a little excessive to sort of expect a complete rollback. I think what is happening is clearly a slowdown in the base of globalization. If that goes a bit too far, then you're sort of introducing inefficiencies in supply chain, uh, you know, too. And that's also by design, you know, inflationary. And you have to pass on that, that extra cost to the end user, i.e. the consumer. And is that whether it's a deceleration of globalization or a true move to regionalization, is that due to the pandemic? Is that due to Russia invading Ukraine? Is that due to global cost of capital being very, uh, I sit here and think about oh, everything yeah. that's come together. It's all of the above, but all, it's, so, the above. it's so interesting. Yeah, no, all of the above. I think all those events exposed, you know, some fragilities that, you know, companies had in terms of their supply chain, but you're right. I mean, I'll take the shipping industry is a great example where pre-pandemic, by and large, without generalizing, but that was an industry that was in quasi distress. I mean, certainly in the high yield bond market, it was a sector that was trading at a pretty meaningful discount. Now it's the complete opposite of that, where you know the shipping industry is sort of viewed as a, as a high quality sector. But I do agree with you. I think 
we've had a number of geopolitical events. We've had the pandemic and that exposed, you know, several weaknesses in the way sort of companies manage their supply chains. And I think it increased the urgency to reduce the reliance on, on those sources of fragility. The other thing that we've seen, which is somewhat related to that, but last year is a great example. We had a big boom in M&A, right? Like, why did we have that big boom in M&A? Is because every company realized that it's very important to have as much as a diversified business model as you can uh, because you can't afford basically depending on one on one market or one product or, 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 or one consumer segment. And so it's the same driver at the end of the day. You go through these large shocks, companies draw the lessons. And one of the lessons I think that we've drawn from, you know, the, the, the past episodes of geopolitical tensions and in, um, in the pandemic is really the need to reduce reliance on those sources of fragility and have a, a business model that is as diversified as, as, as you can. Yeah. And then the final point in the, in the paper is that we ought to expect governments to play a bigger and bigger role, um, which uh, as, as my friend Peter Linneman from, from Wharton um, said last time he was on the Walker webcast, he said, the only thing we have to fear is the government stepping in and putting price controls in place and trying to play too big a role in the economy. Um, does, does Goldman feel the same way in the sense that it likely is going to be more government intervention here, whether it's from a price control standpoint or trying to prop up special industries? Uh, and I want to lead this into ESG. So that's, that's where I'm headed with this. But is there a real concern there? Or do you think that governments will play a marginally higher role, but we can get into this more regional world uh, without having kind of governments take the punch bowl away. I don't think there, there's no concern really other than an acknowledgement that yes, fiscal policy will play a much bigger role. Again, certainly relative to the aftermath of the global financial crisis where with the benefit of hindsight, actually fiscal policy should have played a bigger role because we had uh, you know, contractionary fiscal policy that sort of resulted in a, in, in a weak recovery after the global financial crisis. Now, you may have the opposite of that and you have it for different reasons. I think one of them is, you know, the need to sort of uh, invest in renewable energy, you know, cut the reliance on, uh, you know, some, some commodity exporters a little bit. So, um, you know, it, it's not what I would describe a concern, but that is a reality that needs to be acknowledged. And it certainly has, you know, uh, some implications on, on, on the market side for sure. And so on the ESG side, we talked a little bit about oil and this sort of imbalance, if you will, that exists today. We're, we're trying to get to a less carbon centric economy. And at the same yeah. time, we don't have the renewables already in place. We've got corporate governance that's driving corporations to invest here, but we can't kind of catch up fast enough. Um, anything that you see that might be sort of a, a release valve for this supply demand imbalance as we transition from a carbon economy to a less carbon economy? So one market that I watch actually very closely is sort of the ESG fixed income market. And I can tell you one thing, uh, so demand continues to create its own supply, basically. That is pretty much the story, but one fascinating really development in the last four months, obviously, you know, we started the conversation, you know, commenting on the performance of fixed income year to date and, and how it's been the worst ever. Now, as a result of that, you've had massive outflows basically in, in fixed income funds, except for ESG funds, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a fascinating picture actually, if you look at ESG versus non-ESG fund, it's like a mirror image basically where capital continues to flow into ESG fixed income funds. I'm not even talking about equity funds. And then at the same time, you know, capital is sort of avoiding non-ESG bond funds. And so that's the story. I think, you know, there is still a remarkably strong level of appetite from investors to actually fund anything that has sort of a, that looks like an ESG initiative, uh, which is which is a good thing. Now, the the flip side of that, and this is also an interesting development this year. It used to be two, three, four years ago that you know if you're a company and you decide to issue a green bond, for example that the market would actually reward you for that green bond by giving you a little bit of a borrowing discount. And so there's a variety of estimates of how large that discount is. We think it was around you know, 10, five basis points, depending on the sector and the issuer. That discount has actually completely shrunk this year. Um, it's just not there anymore. And the reason for that 
is that ESG basically in fixed income is sort of gradually becoming mainstream a little bit. I'll give you one staggering stat, 25% of investment grade new issue volumes in the Euro market are ESG today. So for every Euro that gets issued in the primary market, you've got 25 cents that have an ESG label on them. And so there's no question in my mind so that from a capital standpoint, there's an enormous appetite, I think, from investors to fund those initiatives. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. As long as capital is here, I think you can operate that transition. And if I had to make a guess, I do think that that transition will happen a lot quicker than most people think. And so as you look out for the rest of the year, Lotfi, um, what's, the one, what's the one data point that sort of says, okay, things are gonna be okay? Is it Russia decides that they're done invading Ukraine? Is it that we get a inflationary print that makes it so that maybe the Fed doesn't have to do another 50 basis point rise? Is it um, the 10 year settling in somewhere between 275 and, and three for an extended period of time? Or is it something that I'm not even thinking about? So when it comes to sort of assessing that forward outlook, you always have to look at both sides of the equation risk and price of risk. What's the risk and how much you're being paid for that risk? The good news is that over the past two months, the price of risk has gone up. The market is actually paying you a little bit better than it did only a couple of months ago. Now, that means that you have to assess how big are the risks. Uh, yeah, I think on the positive side, obviously any de-escalation of the conflict would be a very welcome development, not just on the human side, but also on the economic side. And then inflation is really key. I mean, if if three, four months from now, we're in a situation where everyone becomes confident that actually there is mean reversion in inflation and that the speed of mean reversion is given enough confidence to the Fed that they can actually engineer a soft landing without pushing too much, without anything sort of breaking in the system. Yeah, that would be a very welcome development. And I can tell you that if I look at high yield bonds, all in yields are around seven and a half, eight percent now. That's a pretty good value proposition if we get that type of scenario where inflation actually comes back, comes down fairly quickly. And then, and then you know, the Fed doesn't deliver anything beyond what's currently already in the price. Yeah, it's great. Um, Lotfi, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really interesting conversation. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us. And um, to everyone who joined us today, thank you so much for tuning into the Walker webcast. I will be back next week with Colorado Senator Michael Bennett to talk about what's going on in Washington. And he's on the Senate Banking Committee. So it'll be interesting to hear Senator Bennett's uh, insights into the markets and what's going on. Again, Lotfi, thanks very much. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Take, take care. Bye.